I'm going to invite uh, Nick Blythe, uh, who is a director of The Singularity, and he is going to uh, discuss the work that uh, The Singularity does for the New South Wales government, uh, in specifically in relation to the digital driver's licence, but other, other initiatives that they have also. So, uh, Nick, uh, as soon as you're ready, you can uh, press the share button and, uh, and come on stage. Nick, great to see you. Great to see you too, John. Thanks. So uh, I'll just wait one moment for you to share your screen. You have a slide deck. I do. Yeah. Okay. So you may as well um, just share that now, and then I will, uh, I will, I will step off. So uh, and move you to it. Share my entire screen. Uh, you can do that, or just a tab, whichever one suits. Okay. All right. How's that? That's great. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. So we'll just wait for that one to load. Um, thanks for the introduction, John. Um, it's great to be with everybody here today. Um, coming from Sydney uh, in New South Wales in Australia, um, the, uh, the weather's just turned, unfortunately, so we're getting a bit of rain now. Um, so it's not all, um, all sunshine down here at the moment. Um, but hopefully internet connection holds well and I can talk to you about some of the great things that we're doing with New South Wales government um, and some of the challenges that we've, uh, that we've faced. Um, so just to talk about uh, the shape of what I'm going to go through today, um, we're going to talk a bit about who you're talking to and uh, get to learn a little bit about the singularity as a, as a business and what we do. Um, and then talk a bit about what's happening happening in New South Wales around identity um, and the digital driving license that's been released. Um, importantly, want to get into some of those technology challenges that exist um, in in government. Um, and I think hopefully there'll be something that a lot of um, a lot of listeners can empathise with. And then talk a little bit about what's coming next on the on the roadmap. And um, I see segues very nicely into Eric's approach. Um, I really just want to give a bit of a, a forward-looking view of where things can go from here, um, given we're in the middle of um, some challenging circumstances with, um, with this pandemic. So first off is to do a bit of introduction. So uh, we're the Singularity Mesh. We're a team of 25 uh, based in Australia um, as an organization. We provide enabling technologies to business and accelerate their capabilities to deliver technology. Um, really important um, to a vision statement that we've developed as an organization. Um, we help across three specific domains, uh, technology, people, and process, which is, a, I think, a really great and straightforward way of looking at uh, how to seg uh, segment the IT sector um, from a technology perspective looking at bringing um, some really incredible software to, to market, whether it be the latest API gateway uh, or some, some data streaming capability like Kafka um, or some of the latest identity capabilities, you know, like uh, I know Auth0 and, and, and Okta are here and we, we partner across the board with some really awesome software as a service and that enablement that we talk about wouldn't be possible well, without some really good software uh, behind us. Um, moving on to, to, to people, we, we provide a lot of engineering, architecture, and delivery resource into the organizations we work with. We're an augment augmentation team as opposed to uh, an outsource team. Uh, and that's just a really a preference in, in how we like to work. Um, allows us to get closer to our customers and really ensure that we're, um, we're delivering maximum value uh, throughout our engagements. And then procedure-wise, we do all sorts of process work. Um, we think it's really important, everything from CICD and DevOps through to API standards and policies. We've set up governance forums, um, everything you could imagine in terms of engineering around APIs, data, um, and identity. So here's a, a quick flash of our, our client list. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, we've got um, some of the uh, sort of fintech 
uh, financial clients that we work with. So working with Vault, BPay, FPOS. Uh, more centrally, we've got some work going on in the sort of construction and property area. Um, we work with uh, a couple of other bigger organizations. Optus is one of the large telcos here in Australia, uh, and Woolworths is one of the largest retailers in the Southern Hemisphere. And then at government, we've got a strong footprint um, with New South Wales government um, and federal. Uh, where we work predominantly is with Service New South Wales, Roads and Maritime, and Education. And um, look, we'll get into a little bit about what we're doing with, uh, with each of those as we progress uh, through the presentation itself. Right, so what do we do across the life cycle? Where, can we, where, do, where do we help companies? Very keen on getting in early, talking about API strategies, how we can work with organizations on monetization approaches, um, extracting value from existing systems, how we can really start to um, bring value out of the organization using APIs uh, and deliver that to, to other companies and, and, and businesses. Um, and then, on, uh, for example, also on uh, the government side, how can we provide an API strategy that's really enabling for the, for the business, for citizens, partners, um, customers and other organizations, and other departments. <clears throat> Very familiar with working on complex architectures, as we'll get into in a moment. Um, I'm not the architect, but um, I do find myself in a number of different meetings uh, that discusses complex architecture on a daily basis, um, and uh, seems to be part of the course when we're putting in a robust API capability. We think alongside that, uh, API governance and ways of working are tremendously important. Um, training and coaching are uh, critical to, to getting these sorts of new API approaches rolled out effectively. We also work on federated API development, vendor selection, uh, partner connection, platform implementation, which is probably the lion's share of the work that we do, um, some API products, and of course, last but um, very much not least, legacy migration. So we talk a lot about uh, moving, you know, from from monolithic to microservices, um, being just part of the story, uh, and actually where we can really add value is enabling uh, decommissioning um, and a uh, completion of the realization of that microservices approach. Um, I'm not going to talk about too much on that today uh, and now move into a couple of other areas. First, uh, I'm just going to talk a bit about our, our partnerships. We work across a number of different clouds. For Apogee, we were partner of the year last year for Asia Pacific. So we're the Apogee partner um, for APAC 2019. Immensely proud of that and, and we've been close to the business for many years. In fact, one of the other founders uh, has, has worked within Apogee uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, we've also worked uh, for uh, on Confluent stuff with Kafka, um, Auth0, Okta, and, and Data Stacks. And we see amongst these partnerships some of that really good software as a service capability that's emerging um, and the architectures that can be created from these elements can really help drive some substantial enablement, speed to market, um, and a bunch of other uh, benefits for our clients. Quick one on um, some of our awards, um, and I promise I'll get into the, um, the main thrust of the, the presentation shortly. Um, like I said, we won Partner of the Year. We've also been involved in um, the Apple Watch launch over at Woolworths, which is um, a major retailer in Australia. And we've done some work for Google directly around the Google Assistant. Um, which culminated in us in contributing to the open source project around dialogue flow uh, and providing some code in, um, which was used um, moving towards production for, for dialogue flow for Google. Um, so that's a bit about our credibilities and um, you know what's uh, why we've got here today. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, New South Wales Digital Drivers License itself. Um, and then get into those tech challenges um, and, uh, and what's next um, after that moment. 
So New South Wales Digital Driving Licence. Let's just set the scene a little bit. I want to talk to you about why Service New South Wales was created and what it is. Um, and I, tell, I think I'm going to do that through uh, a little story about what's happened with citizens and New South Wales government. So historically, um, citizens have had to connect to New South Wales government um, in lots of different ways. So if there's a, a, a birth um, or a marriage, you would have to go to one department. That, other, that one department wouldn't necessarily speak to another department. And there was a really low level of interruptibility. At its peak, New South Wales government had 168 different departments and entities. And so if you think about from a citizen's perspective, it is absolutely perplexing trying to get something done for as simple as changing your address or updating some simple details. Historically, citizens have had to do that across many different organizations. The interoperability across that group has been fairly low, and that meant that data has been shared, lost multiple times. The complexity really sits with the, the citizen. So um, in Walk Service New South Wales, simple objective, is to put that complexity behind a single facade, a single layer. Um, so Service New South Wales was created some years ago, um, and it, what it allowed was an abstraction of the complexity of dealing with all those different government organizations. And it meant, from a citizen perspective, you could just go to one place and make all the changes that you need. And Service New South Wales takes care of all those things across all those different channels. That address change that was taking you uh, multiple visits to various different departments in your lunch hour is now means that you can just go into a single place and make multiple changes in, in one visit. Of course, it's not just about face-to-face. -face. There are a number of different channels that are available. You've got the, uh, the classic um, uh, retail outlets where you can visit. Um, and make some updates in person. You've got website, you've got an app, which I'm gonna be talking about shortly. Uh, there's also a foray into voice and chatbots and other connection techniques. What I think I want you to take away from this slide is that Service New South Wales um, have created a facade on, on top of government in order to hide the complexity. And the reason that that narrative is important is because it rings absolutely true to the architectures that we develop um, when we're putting in API gateways. And an effective API gateway can hide complexity in downstream systems and abstract that for the, the, the lighter weight consuming citizen or application. So I want you to just lock in your mind a view of that, um, that diagram architecture because we'll be coming back to that in a, in a little while in a different format. So, are you sick of hearing about digital transformation? We hear it all the time. Um, I think it's a, it's a fairly well-used phrase. My personal view is I, I, I quite like it. However, I do hear it a lot, um, and it represents many things to, to a lot of different people. And I think uh, quite often it's used in areas where there may not actually be a genuine digital transformation. But the one thing's for sure, the New South Wales Digital Driving Licence has represented a true digital transformation. The history behind it is that as, a, as an individual citizen in New South Wales, you have to take your driving licence everywhere and you have to have it in your pocket whenever you're in a vehicle. But now since the advent of a digital driving license, you don't have, you do not need to take that physical license. You can just take your phone. So now I've got my license. I've got my um, payment cards, credit cards, debit cards. Everything else exists in my phone wallet. Now I really don't need to, to leave the house with that third item. So I get the keys, I'll get my phone, and I can, I can leave the house without the wallet and can actually leave that at home because it's all contained within my digital device. So from a citizen experience, it really improves um, how, um, how I can get access to my information and how I can prove, 
uh, I am who I am. So I want to talk a bit about success of, of the digital driving license program in New South Wales. We have 5.7 uh, million people with a driving license um, in New South Wales, and I think the population there is approximately 7, 7 million individuals. So I see a real high level of, of um, photo ID cards and digital driving licenses. In the Service New South Wales app, we've enjoyed 1.7 million downloads. And look, I'm not gonna stay here or sit here and tell you that the Service New South Wales is the first digital driving license that's been out in the market. It certainly was one of the earliest. What it is though, for uh, almost certainly is uh, the most successful. So the amount of usage, the amount of downloads, the way it's being adopted, and how it's being built into an ecosystem has really allowed it to, to, to stand apart. So in um, in a few short months, 1.7 million downloads has been achieved um, with a, a very basic marketing campaign um, and word of mouth. We've seen incredible adoption uh, in the recent months, um, as with many digital, um, uh, digital uh, sites. Um, there's been a, a very big spike during the, um, the recent months. What I want to talk about is the App Store results, which really demonstrate a separation from um, the, the competition, as it were. So if you look under utilities within the Australian um, iTunes App Store, Service New South Wales is number, fifth, uh, num yeah, number five. And uh, the first time you, you come across another government application, is the My South Australia government, uh, which is at number 48. So Service New South Wales is right up there with um, Google, Optus and Telstra, which are the big telcos, and it's even in front of um, Microsoft Edge. So incredibly well-used application, um, well-regarded by the users, um, and um, really has started to enable different experiences and an improved experience um, for uh, for citizens. All right, so I want to talk a bit about the technology challenges now. Uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, so uh, please bear with me. Um, so I, I just want to shape up how things look in terms of government technology stacks, what we're used to seeing, and what we have to deal with, and what, this, what the citizen kind of has to deal with as well, and, and where we're moving to. Um, we'll be familiar with the monolithic application. Um, it's got seasonal re releases. It's um, feature-based development. It's expensive. It's slow moving, but you do get some security and reliability. And there tends to be not just one monolith, but maybe two, three, or four, and they exist within several different government departments in, in that way. Um, historically, this has been the way uh, things have been done. But now, as you, you well know, well, sorry, first, the, the final point on this one is um, the consumption patterns around call center and the department service center, really what the uh, drivers were in terms of building those monolithic applications. Those are the consumption channels. Consumption channels of call center and the service center itself. That's important because look at the number of people that are using those apps. In a call center, we, it would be entirely predictable what time of day there would be high levels of use on your monolithic application. Um, we would know that there would be 100, 150 people in a call center and maybe 1,000 people across service centers that were using our applications at one particular time. And what makes that really interesting is that we're moving now, but for design, those applications were absolutely fit for purpose. And so it's not necessarily that the monoliths were bad, but they were never designed for, for what was coming. And, and how could they predict that? So we had those government departments, and then what we've added is microservices, so we've gone, okay, we can abstract some of the logic that exists within the monolith and we can put them into microservices, potentially into cloud, um, and we can extract some of the data layers as well. And you know what? That allows us to move a lot quicker and that allows us to, to separate out some of the concerns and we can speed up releases in, in this way. 
How we do that effectively um, is by using uh, an API gateway. And I think what, what this illustrates the most to me is that we've got all these different consumption patterns now. So we have a, the call center, the service center, apps, websites, there's events, telemetry that's coming into the business, uh, and there are development APIs, as we well know. So it's not that um, necessarily the monoliths were, were built in the wrong way. It's just that they were never built with the predictions of today's demand patterns. If we look at the uh, digital demand pattern of an app or a website, they're literally on 24-7 based on a news article or something else that comes out in the press. There can be an enormous spike um, in terms of the usage, and that can cause some significant uh, challenges for the, for the downstream systems. So this is really what's happened. We don't, that's the vision of one specific department. Let's call it transport. But we all know that there's a lot more than one department um, in, uh, in a government technology stack. So suddenly we've got copies and copies of this monolith microservice API gateway uh, stack across all the different uh, departments. And one of the challenges that we have is starting to pull that together, building identity and trust, pulling together and making sure that there's security there and that data is effectively shared interoperably across those different departments and domains. So back onto digital driving license. What did we have to build? So we had an app to build and we had some APIs to build. And what was good was a lot of the existing logic was there already. What made it challenging is that it was in different monoliths in different parts of the, the government organization. So we had to go to Service New South Wales to, to, to find um, some content and information from there. Um, Roads and Maritime hold a lot of the records around uh, digital driving license. There had to be some coordination there. And we had to create some microservices um, and extrapolate those through the, um, through the API platform. So really the main job was about orchestrating, pulling all this information and data together and serving it in a rapid and seamless way to a, a high demand mobile application. We did that by bringing in uh, an API platform, um, sticking that in across, uh, across Service New South Wales in a very similar way to the, um, to the business uh, architecture and illustration I was talking about earlier. And um, the majority of the work came in working with those different disparate groups. We had some challenges uh, around throughput and, and transactions per second, which was creating some latency. And we continue to this day uh, revising and improving those where we can. So now I want to talk about what's next. Okay, so uh, and then get onto some onto some questions. So um, the API ecosystem partnerships very very important. With a digital driving license, there is a, a QR code on there. It's integrated in. There's work with pubs and clubs and restaurants and bars, um, large hotel chains. They're allowing this seamless identity provision to be uh, enabled. So uh, whether it's through a scan facility or, or through uh, other means, there's an ecosystem of identification that can be created. We've now moved into a, a COVID safe contact tracing mode. So using the, the technology and the facading and the, the other capabilities around orchestration, we built the contact tracing capability um, coming soon. Um, maybe a permit on vaccinations. I think it's um, a little bit controversial today as uh, Scott Morris has come out and uh, suggested that um, everybody in Australia, uh, it's mandatory for us to get a vaccine. So all of that's interesting how it might play out in the, uh, in the coming months. Um, and then finally, um, for if you don't have a digital driving license, you have a photo ID, uh, soon you'll be able to use the, um, uh, the license in the Service New South Wales application. Uh, and with that, yeah, I just want to uh, hand over to um, back to John for some questions. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, great, great insights there into how um, how you, you managed to utilise the uh, the digital identity that comes from the digital driver's license to other services. Um, 
there, there is a question from Yuko asking about a, a social security number like um, an ID in, in Australia. And I know that you can talk on the state level. Uh, I believe that there is a, a federal government uh, initiative for, for digital identity, but that, that um, but the digital identity initiatives so far have been largely state state driven. Is, is that um, an accurate well, statement? Well, people ask me, John, if, uh, if we've got a single view of the customer from a government level, uh, and I always say we've got several single customer views. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on how you're looking at things, whether it's a federal level or a state, there is a number of initiatives. It is centralizing. Um, but there are still a level of fragmentation across government around various IDs and specific numbers. Um, so social security as such is a, a, um, a federal element and you still have a, you have a Medicare number and, and various other elements. So mm -hmm. um, difficult to pin that one down really, but there's multiple yeah. IDs. Well, I, I think there are some common challenges uh, of, of every government technology organization because different departments have grown up with their own systems and the idea of APIs is to try to draw them together. So uh, you, you provided some great insights into New South Wales. We're going to talk to Monica Basada at a moment um, about the European Commission, which is not one country, but many. And um, so, uh, and we're going to ask you to come back uh, after Monica has spoken to, to, compare, uh, to compare notes about how to, to face into these challenges of, of harmonizing and, and integrating uh, services across the different departments. So thanks, thanks very much for, for Thank your Thanks, John. Time. I appreciate the opportunity.